Good evening. Thank you for being with us tonight. We are going to begin the meeting around 535 to give everybody a chance to join us um, and get settled in. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Rochelle. No. Okay, hey, Rochelle. Great. Hi. <laughs> All right. You can start your camera whenever you're able. Wonderful. Can't hear you. Try try again. <laughs> oh, it unmutes. Okay. There you go. Now can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And see me? Yes. Okay. And so you can you can see me because I can't see. I'm only seeing Jen. We can see you. Perfect. Okay. That's perfect. Um, and if we can begin um, at 5.35. Um, so another minute. And then whenever okay. you're ready. Sounds good. Oh, there's quite a few people.
Rochelle, you, uh, we can get going anytime you're ready. Go ahead. I think okay. we, I think we've got a lot of people already. Okay. So if you want to get started. <laughs> Will I start then? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. Um, my name is Rochelle and I'm, I would like to just welcome you all and thank you for coming. It's a pretty important um, opportunity for us in Santa Rosa. We are the biggest city in the county and we're going to be able to utilize some monies that we, that we all voted for um, a couple of years ago. And um, this meeting tonight is mostly for the sports and athletic groups that use the park. There's course parks um, for all, all sorts of other things, neighborhood parks, et cetera, trails and walking and things. But this meeting is mostly for the sports and athletic groups that use um, and permit some of the parks around. Um, so I want to introduce Jen Santos. Um, she is a deputy director of the parks and will be um, co-hosting or coasting this. And um, there's a few other people that will be moving along and, um, and Emily Anders also will be the host. So um, do we move on or? I'm not sure. Do I push the next slide button? Kind of. Oh, there. <laughs> you just have to let uh, host um, Andrew know that you want her to roll to the next slide, but that's good. You're good to go. <laughs> okay. So um, anyway, we're the presenters and there'll be, um, there, you can see the agenda there that's going to go through. It is a, um, an hour, basically an hour and a half meeting, maybe a little bit longer. We're trying to in, incorporate sport, uh, question and answers so that people can ask them along the way. Um, the, it is really important that we get background for the parks department to present to the city. The city council um, and measure M require, uh, you know, evidence, so to speak. And, and this is one of the pieces and rolling through for the next year, there'll be other kinds of things as well um, for the next steps. So next uh, slide. Um. Okay, and I'll, I'll take it from here, Rochelle. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. And I want to th thank, thank you for being here. It's really important uh, for us to have the sports community represented here. And uh, Michelle's, uh, Rochelle's helped us uh, get to where we're at with this uh, presentation. And although we think it's a little long, we hope to, you know, we hope to roll through it quickly. This information is super important so that when we are having conversations with the council members as well as executives, we can provide this information to them. And uh, we also wanted you to know that there is some, uh, we do have some limitations with the polling we can do in this um, Zoom setting. So we will be sending you all a separate survey that you can take where you can uh, type to your heart's content answers and things that you need to tell us that we aren't able to collect tonight. So just so you know, when you're taking this polling, you'll have another opportunity to provide additional feedback. Um, so just to get us started with an overview of what is Measure M. So the Sonoma County voters passed this in uh, 2018. It's an eight cents sales tax uh, that is for 10 years going till 20. 29, and it provides an estimate of 1.9 million annually to the city of Santa Rosa by itself. Other agencies in the county collect um, different fees based on the tax, uh, but since we're the largest city, we get a pretty large percentage of that. It's dedicated exclusively to improving parks and recreation needs. Um, and also there's a maintenance of effort. So when we applied for this, we need to keep the same amount of um, maintenance and commitment we had uh, in the beginning. Next slide, please. And so um, this list here is exactly taken verbatim from the measure. These are the specific allowable uses in the measure M. Uh, we've highlighted in blue there things we think are more specific directly to sports and sports activities. And it involves maintenance as well as improvements. So that's why we're here today to ask you uh, what's more, what is important to you? What are your priorities? Next slide, please. And so uh, 
when we decided how we were going to spend this money, we thought of ways to move forward and we recognized at that time that we had a really heavy need to uh, recover the parks that were fire damage. So council in 2019 dedicated uh, the first two years of funding from received from Measure M to recovering the fire damaged parks from the 2017 fire. They also um, provided funding for a deferred maintenance priority list. So we're gonna go out to the parks this year and find out um, what kind of condition they're in and make a really good assessment of the conditions of the park. Uh, we have a good idea, but this list will give us a definitive um, idea. And uh, the third thing is develop and implement a community outreach plan. And that's what we're doing here tonight. We're asking the community and specifically the sports community tonight, uh, what are the priorities that we should be using for, this, uh, for these funds that we're gonna receive for the next 10 years? Next slide. And so um, when we're done collecting all this data in the community, including tonight's data, we're gonna return to council in spring of 2021 to have a discussion with the council about what the next um, three to 10 years should be, uh, what we should be spending on that, what our priorities should be. Um, and we'll be settling in on um, an updated schedule for spending. Next slide, please. Um, let's see. So <laughs> before we get to uh, our next, you know, community polling, we wanted to also talk about the sources of funding the Rec and Parks team receives uh, separate from Measure M, just so you get a good sense of where we have funds and where we do not have funds. So if we're looking to have park improvements, we receive parks, um, uh, we receive funds through the park development impact fees per quadrants of the city. And we'll go over that in the next slide. We also can request uh, one-time funds occasionally from the general fund for special projects. It's very rare, uh, which is why we have park development impact fees for developing parks. Um, and we apply for lots of grants every year, two to three grants at least every year to try to receive funds and help double our money or at least um, find the funds we can't usually find for things. The recreation program itself uh, is funded staffing with general fund and they also receive some special funds from measure O um, for neighborhood services programs. And for park maintenance, uh, that's all the staffing and uh, mowers and blowers and trucks and things they need is all funded from the general fund. Um, and then we have a deferred maintenance need. So those are things that think things that need to be have heavy repairs to them or have updates and there's no specific funding source for those things. That's where we struggle to find funds for those particular items. And so this, you know, we wanted to present that to you so you could think about that as we roll forward. And I don't know if Rochelle, you had anything else to add or <laughs> I know we talked about this particular slide a little earlier. Um, I uh, No, I think you okay. covered that. I, we had asked that question, you're, you're fine there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so here's where I was talking about. Um, we um, park development impact fee zones, and this is a map from the general plan. And if you look at the line that's going essentially up and down or um, north and south, that's Highway 101. And the horizontal line is Highway 12. So the city receives funds from residential subdivisions and developers developing throughout the city who, instead of providing parkland or dedicating parkland, provide in-lieu park fees. And they are collected per quadrant. So Northwest quadrant, Southwest, Northeast, Southeast. And the funds are then spent in those quadrants. They stay in there. Occasionally funds can be combined from different quadrants in order to facilitate um, something unique in the city. Um, so it's not completely exclusive, but generally the funds do stay in those quadrants. So we wanted to share that with you so you had a, a good idea. Um, and also we're gonna roll into some polling in just a minute. And I want you to take a look and decide or, or try to do your best to figure out where you live. Uh, Cause it's one of the simple things that we can ask. And we do like to know um, 
from our participants um, which quadrant you do live in. It helps us understand the bigger picture. And so if you live um, essentially north of Highway 12 and west of Highway 101, you're going to be in the northwest quadrant. Youth Community Park is over there. Um, and we've got um, a place to play in that quadrant as well. And if you go into the southwest quadrant, um, which is south of Highway 12 and west of 101, hope I'm getting that all right for those of you listening on phones, uh, Rosen Creek Community Park is down there, Bear Park. And then in the northeast quadrant, um, you're gonna be north of Highway 12 and east of Highway 101. So you've got Nagasawa Park up there, Francis Nielsen, things like that. Um, and the southeast quadrant is south of Highway 12 and east of 101. And we've got Galvin Community Park out there, Bennett Valley, um, Martin Luther King Park, as well as um, Howarth Park in that quadrant. And before we get into the polling, I have a few more introductions to do. I wanted to introduce uh, those folks you see here that you don't see their faces, but you might see their names. Uh, we have host Emily Ander, who's helping us host the meeting tonight, as well as host uh, Mary Lou Nichols, who's gonna help. They're doing all the magic behind the scenes here, helping us advance slides. And there's a lot going on behind the scenes to get us to where we're at. Um, we also have M Amy Rockelwitz, who is our recreation supervisor, and she's going to help facilitate questions and answers if there's anything on the recreation side during our question and answer period. She can help us with that uh, just in case. And we wanted to let you know there might be some slight delays when we're advancing slides, um, but bear with us. We're working through all of our um, background uh, virtual meeting components. And sometimes it takes a minute or two. Um, and I have some information to read. So you kind of get a sense of how we're going to do questions and answers and polling. So members of the public joining this meeting, you will have your microphones muted. If you're phoning in to join the meeting and you choose to speak during the question and answer period or the public information portion of the meeting, for privacy concerns, the host will rename you to caller and only show the last four digits of your phone number. Additionally, the City of Santa Rosa is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment free from disruption and will not tolerate hateful speech or actions. Everyone is expected to participate respectfully or if necessary, the meeting will end immediately. Uh, Madam Host, will you please explain how public comments will be heard at today's meeting? Yes, Madam Facilitator. Uh, throughout the presentation, the facilitator will open the floor for questions and answers and public comments. The host will lower all hands until the public comments item is open. Once the facilitator has called for public comment, the facilitator will ask the public to raise their hand if they wish to speak. Those joining by phone may dial star nine to raise your hand. The host will then call on those who have, ra have raised their hands. The host will unmute your microphone for your comment and then will mute you once you are finished speaking. A courtesy timer will appear while you ask your question or make your comment. The facil facilitator, presenter, or host will respond to each question or comment as it is raised. You will need to raise your hand again if a follow-up question is generated based upon the response you've received. Uh, I also want to let you know that there is an opportunity to ask questions throughout the presentation by clicking the question and answer feature in your Zoom toolbar and typing in your question. The host will keep an eye on these questions and will answer them in writing as time allows, or will ask the presenters to answer them live at intervals throughout the presentation. Any questions that are not answered during the presentation will be addressed during the questions and public comment periods during the presentation. Thank you, Madam Facilitator. All right, thank you, host Ander. And so um, take a, one last look at this map and remember the places where you live. We're gonna roll into a very easy poll, uh, asking you essentially some basic information so you can get used to how to respond in the virtual setting. And then we'll roll into our sports questions um, after we give some information. So can we start the next slide and look at the polling, please?
I just want to speak briefly about the polling. Um, all the poll questions will be either single or multiple choice. You must answer all questions in order to submit your responses. The submit button is at the very end of the poll. So you may need to scroll down um, to the bottom of your screen in order to find it. If you are completing the poll on your smartphone, you must answer the first question before you can answer the second question, et cetera. If you are participating in the meeting via a landline, you will not be able to participate in the poll at this time. However, the poll will be turned into a survey and sent out via an email um, on Monday, as uh, Jen mentioned earlier. And that survey will be available for two weeks. Once everyone has completed the poll and it has been closed, the results will appear immediately and the, the facilitator will walk you through the results. Thank you very much. Thank you, host Ander. All right, let's let's start this polling. And so this is that first question about generally where do you live? It's nice for us. And if you live outside the city limits, no problem. We have a selection there for you. I know some of our coaches and folks live outside the city limits, but still use still use our parks. Um, and so we've got to divide it divided up there for northwest, northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast. And then, of course, your age group. And how often do you visit uh, Santa Rosa Parks and Recreation? So some pretty basic questions. Hopefully, we can help facilitate that for you and give you a couple more minutes. We do have, um, if any of you were able to attend the first Measure M meeting this spring, uh, we do have plenty of time for the polls. I know the last one, we, there was a timer we discovered during the meeting there was a timer. Uh, these do not have timers, so we have plenty of time. So um, I'll be checking in with the host to see how we're doing, but I'll give you a couple minutes there or a minute. How are we doing, host Ander? We have 15 of 21 submitted. Okay, give a little bit more. And then we'll go ahead and close it. We're at 16 of 21 and it's holding steady. Okay, let's go ahead and look at the results. So this will be fun. We get to see the results live similar to our in-person meeting, which is fun. So now we can get a sense of essentially where folks are participating in this meeting from. Uh, a lot of folks from the Northeast Quadrant and outside the city limits and a pretty good spread on age groups. And we've got folks visiting our parks every day uh, at 50%, which is great. All right. Um, so that's pretty good results. Easy. Hopefully you've gotten used to how to respond on your computer or uh, electronic device. Are we good to move forward, host Ander? Have we collected all the information? I will turn that over to host Nichols to find out. She's working on that end of things. I need just a few more minutes. Just so the public knows, Zoom doesn't do a very good job of sharing these results. Um, and so, it's helpful if we can write down what we're seeing right now because we don't get to see it again. Okay, we can move on. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so we wanted to roll into a section uh, talking about our sports programs and our, uh, where everything is located. Uh, we're going to start big. Here's the map again from general plan that gen shows in green uh, the city's parks as well as it shows the Annadale State Park and uh, the county's Spring Lake Park and uh, our baseball park at the top there, or Shiloh Regional Park at the top there. Um, and the trees, those red trees you see on there are um, future or proposed uh, locations for new parks in the city. And so uh, let's roll into the next slide. 
And so here's another way of looking at it with everything stripped away except um, Highway 101 and Highway 12 showing the quadrants. All the green is the um, city's park system overall. And let's look at it by the numbers. Next slide, please. So here's kind of a big picture overview of the entire parks system. And um, one thing we discovered is that all of us in Rec and Parks collect information differently. And so you'll see uh, we have two bocce courts at DeMayo and Juilliard. That's just, we have two areas of bocce at two different parks. It doesn't mean we, you know, we have a lot of bocce actual courts, uh, but it's just showing two areas, whereas the basketball is showing actual courts. Um, we also have area numbers for handball, horseshoe, uh, and horseshoe as well. Those are just numbers, so if we have those things at a park, it's just listed once. Um, and we get that from our GIS information, our geographical information system, uh, whereas the recreation team uses different numbers because they're looking at rentable spaces, and we kind of look at those a little differently. Um, so soccer, we have 18 soccer fields that are used for rentable spaces. And uh, we have 15 tennis areas. Obviously, we have more courts. Um, it looks like that's listed by uh, area. So Fenley, Galvin, and Howarth. And some of, those, uh, some of those courts are pickleball. So we have eight pickleball combined with tennis. And we have five it looks like areas of baseball and softball. So you may be thinking of it in different terms, but we just wanted to give you a big sense, the big picture. Um, you don't need to call us and tell us we got a number wrong. We, we totally get it, we understand, but we just wanted to see the big picture of some of the sports that are available here at the city. And so as you're looking and thinking about this, um, are there any other sports that need to be brought to the city or should we be thinking of other sports? And so we just want to give you a sense of that. Ne next slide, please. And so here's just a um, you know, quick overview of the Northeast Quadrant. We'll zoom in a little bit. And so um, the green outlines are the existing parks and you can see Highway 101 and 12 there. So zooming in, you can really see some of those, some of those parks. Um, you can see Franklin Park kind of off to the left of center there uh, with our soccer fields and, and baseball. And um, let's go into the next quadrant, the Southeast quadrant, I believe. <laughs> Getting off of my, yeah, Northeast quadrant, sorry. And so same thing here, we just wanted to make sure that we are um, looking at what sort of fields we have per quadrant. And so, um, 18 total fields and courts here. Again, they don't represent every single uh, soccer field necessarily. We, we try to generalize sometimes. They might be used for one big field, might be used for two, uh, two practices. And so we've got um, some horseshoe courts as well as handball. Let's look at the map. Next slide, please. And so if you look at the map when we talk about southeast quadrant, we're talking south of 12 and east of 101. So we've got Kiwanis Springs and the big sports park for us, for the city of Santa Rosa, Galvin is in there, as well as we have a, a soccer field at Martin Luther King. Um, so we've got um, quite a bit going on at Galvin Community Park. And so you can kind of see some of our larger parks in there. Next slide, please. And uh, we've got 11 total sports um, and fields in the Southeast Quadrant with uh, four half basketball courts and one full court. And we've got um, tennis as well at um, Howarth Park. And um, I think we might, yeah, I think we probably put uh, actually Howard Park in the Northeast Quadrant and Galvin Park in the Southeast Quadrant. So sorry about that. But the idea is to get you thinking about what sort of sports are in the city and generally where they're located. Next slide, please. 
And so if we move over to the southwest quadrant of town, just a reminder for you for some of the types of sports that are out here in our green is the parks and we have Bear uh, Neighborhood Park here. We also have Southwest Community Park. We have soccer and baseball um, at that park, which is really, really, really popular. <laughs> and uh, we also have um, four full basketball courts as well. And um, we have a volleyball at Bear Park. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh, we don't say anything. We do actually have one there. So I, that's what I wanted to make sure I'm talking to you about some of the stuff that is there. So Bear is a relatively newer park. And so we do have volleyball at Bear Park, although it's not something necessarily rented from a recreation perspective. All right, so I would say Southwest is Southwest Community Park is one of our larger parks for sports and uh, finally finishing off at the Northwest Quadrant. Um, up there, of course, we've got our big soccer uh, baseball park, a place to play the big uh, rectangular park down near the bottom left corner of your screen. And so this would be north of Highway 12 and west of 101. And we also have Northwest Community Park with baseball, soccer, and rugby. And uh, although Youth Community Park is shown at the top right part of the screen, we aren't able to fit any soccer fields in there just um, at this time. We still need to do environmental analysis. But uh, we've got quite a bit going on in each, in each quadrant. And so here's another, here's, a, here's uh, the quadrant by the number. So we've got 34. Um, different types of sports going on or fields or courts in the Northwest Quadrant, so quite a few. And then I believe we have a summary. Yeah, we do have a summary. And so this kind of gives you, um, uh, you know, one glance look at the sports fields overall. Um, and we're um, looking at lighted fields and courts that we have out there as well. It's not necessarily we found out uh, things that we uh, collect data on, but it's important. I, we know to the sports community, uh, we hear from uh, the teams a lot that lighted fields, especially in the fall and winter like now, are really, really important. And so um, we've got in the Southeast Quadrant, the 11 tennis courts and four youth tennis courts out at, at uh, Galvin. And then in the Northwest, we've got three lighted softball areas. And in the Northeast, we've got a softball, tennis courts and pickleball lighted, and that would be Finley, Finley Community Center for the tennis and pickleball. All right, so we just, so hopefully that gives you a, a good sense and gets you thinking about the types of sports we have here at the city generally where they're located. We know some of the numbers are a little bit off on our slideshow tonight, but we wanted to give you the big picture and remind you of where we were at. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Rochelle. And if you have anything else to add, Rochelle, and we do have a community poll specific about sports. And I'm so glad that Rochelle could join us because she's been in the community for 20 plus year um, in sports and she has a lot of valuable insight. And so I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Rochelle, okay. to conduct our poll. Okay, thanks. Um, so actually I have to say that I've been around for 60 years. And um, so I've lived here all my life and I uh, have seen things grow uh, from different, the par only parks were just Doyle Park and Howarth Park way back in the day. And then a few things happened and um, Franklin and finally in the 90s, um, the, there was a community trust, a, a ball trust, uh, softball, baseball, uh, archery, I don't know, several different, and all soccer um, came in and started paying per player to put into a field trust. And those monies helped to develop Galvin because um, the city has never been able to really afford to purchase that kind of land and do those things. But Galvin's a beautiful park and a wonderful um, park out in the uh, north, no, southeast quadrant. Um, but that was in the 90s. And finally, uh, the city also, the, the new sport of the decade was soccer. And the city finally was able to put in fields at place to play. The first three fields were soccer and a couple of baseball fields um, there. It's not lighted. Uh, it is a 
fabulous park in terms of being able to gather kids for tournaments or other kinds of things, and yet it's not lighted. So that's, that's an issue. And I want to say, um, when you're going through these next kinds of things, kind of take a look or think about how that affects us. Our whole city, every single sports team in soccer, every single sport has to go out of town to be able to play. And that's just ridiculous when we are the biggest city of the, of the county. You know, in contrast, Petaluma is a third of our size and has four lighted fields and four artificial turf fields. And that's the other point I was always, I've been trying to make for 10 years. Um, artificial fields are su more supportive of gathering more people because you can play all year round on it. Um, and while we are in a drought, that's really not a great way to um, get fields. You know, when it's rainy, we don't have them. So um, I go ahead and go to the next slide. I just want you to think of those kinds of things. I know that there's um, tennis and there's other sports and stuff, but some of my background, a lot of my background comes from um, soccer, so. Before we get into the community poll, do we want to open, open okay. the floor up for questions uh, and public input? Yeah. One yeah, question so. that perhaps Jen could answer live that was just um, typed into the Q&A which is, does the city have any plans for adding future lights to any of our current soccer fields? Yes. <laughs> Overall, yes. We are working hard at looking at options for lighting different fields. Um, as you all know, this, our community knows, a lot of our existing parks are embedded in neighborhoods um, that have been established without lights. So it is a little bit of an uphill battle for some of these, but we are definitely committed to looking at options for lighting fields, including future options for a place to play. Uh, so the answer is yes, nothing specific yet, but we are moving that direction. And so I know I am going to uh, turn it back to uh, the hosts to talk about how to ask a question. <laughs> Otherwise, if anybody else has any questions before we roll into our sports uh, questions we have for you all. So I'm just gonna go over, go over this each time we have the opportunity for question and answer and public input um, in case anyone joins in the middle of the meeting. Please raise your hand now if you wish to speak. Those joining by phone may dial star nine to raise your hand. Host Nichols will then call on those who have raised their hands the host will unmute your microphone for your comment and then will mute you once you are finished speaking. A courtesy, a courtesy timer will appear while you ask your question or make your comment. The facilitator, presenter, or host will respond to each question or comment as it is raised. You will need to raise your hand again if a follow-up question is generated based upon the response received. Do we have any questions? Yes, we have several speakers. The first <clears throat> is Derek Huntington, followed by Josh Sterling. Derek, please unmute your microphone. I've enabled your speaking permissions. I'll lower your hand and you may provide your comment. Can you see the courtesy timer? I can. Thank you. Please provide your name for the record if you so choose and provide your comment. Your time begins now. Yeah, my, my name is Derek Huntington. Um, I am the current vice president of Rinkin Valley Little League, uh, which would be in the uh, northeast quadrant uh, primarily, but we also have operations uh, throughout the, this, uh, the city um, at Galvin Park, Franklin Park, uh, Rinkin Valley Community Park. Um, my primary comments are related to, uh, you know, what the needs of the league would be for our players and our community. Um, you know, currently, actually, I'm in charge of permitting fields for the league and I'm struggling to uh, find a location uh, for assessments, uh, an all weather field location for our assessments that are held uh, mid to end of January. Um, our, our normal sources um, are, are uh, school turf fields um, or Santa Rosa Junior College's all weather facility, but all of those facilities are currently not being permitted because of the, the COVID pandemic. And so uh, we're running into a situation where uh, you know, we're either going to need to hold them at our own facilities um, or try to permit, um, you know, some some grass and dirt fields, which may or may not, you know, uh, be, be good with weather and everything. Um, so, you know, uh, I would say that the primary need from the baseball community, uh, speaking from our community of, of almost 800 players a year, it's, we've been up in the 900s in some cases. 
Um, and we're looking at a season between five and 600 in 2021, um, even given the pandemic, um, is, is a need for an all weather and, and, uh, and lighted facilities, um, you know, to have access um, for our assessments, uh, but also, you know, uh, the ability to play year round um, and to be able to train. Um, I also uh, am running a nonprofit that uh, sponsors baseball teams and, and uh, you know, is it, we're, we're again challenged to find lighted locations that have been, have been lucky with the weather uh, so far uh, this year. So, um, you know, all weather facilities, great. I've heard, uh, you know, um, and, and, and Emily, I believe, uh, mentioned that there's, there's conversations about, uh, you know, potentially all weather fields, a place to play. Uh, which would be a fine location. We'd be happy to go across town if, if that's where the space is. Um, and yeah, being able to hold tournaments here as well. Um, you know, I'm also connected to the travel ball community in, in a number of ways uh, would be great um, and would require, you know, uh, you know, let's call it three, two to four fields um, available all at the same time in the same location to really manage, uh, you know, a baseball tournament over a weekend. So um, I appreciate all these efforts and, uh, and, and excited about the potential for these funds. And uh, thank you for the time. I'm done. Thank you, Derek. Josh Sterling, you are next. I am allowing your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. State your name for the record if you so choose and begin your comment. Your time starts now. Hello, everyone. Thanks. Uh, Josh Sterling, Vice President, Santa Rosa United Soccer. Um, I could probably just say that I would want to comment what Derek said, but for soccer, but I just sort of wanted to share um, a little bit of what I'm doing right now. I'm listening to you guys, super excited to what you guys are, are talking about, and, and thanks for having us all uh, comment in. I'm sitting in my car parked at S Park and Rohnert Park, so my son trains down here three days a week because we're not able to have lit fields, or we do not have lit fields up in Santa Rosa anywhere. So three days a week, I come down here uh, due to everything going on. I go shopping at Target in Rona Park. I grab my gas in Rona Park. I get food in Rona Park. And I'd much rather be doing all that in Santa Rosa, not just driving as far as well. So just the echoing the need for lit, <clears throat> lit fields, um, lit grass fields would obviously be okay, but um, it really prohibits us um, to be able to play soccer during the winter. And if you've ever seen a soccer field after a rain and letting people on it, um, it's not a very good soccer field anymore after one or two rains. So all weather fields, lit fields, super important. And as um, Rochelle pointed out, you know, you can look around to the other cities and, um, you know, smaller populations, but uh, more lit fields. So just echoing what Derek said for a different sport. Um, I think all weather, even multi-sport fields with lights and all weather would be a, a huge asset to the, the city of Santa Rosa. So thanks for your time. Just wanted to add some comments and a, a real life story. Thank you, Josh. Our next speaker is Teo Alexander. Teo, I am enabling your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. State your name for the record if you so choose and your time begins now. Yeah, this is Teo Alexander. Thank you for the time. I just want to briefly correct a couple of because in Santa Rosa, there are eight designated courts. Four are in the Northeast Quadrant at Howard Park, and four are in the Northwest Quadrant at Finley, which also has two temporary lines drawn on tennis courts. I uh, just want to reiterate the desperate need for new and uh, quality pickleball courts in the city of Santa Rosa. Um, those eight courts uh, that I mentioned, the surfaces are not very adequate quality. There's bubbles and there's cracks everywhere. Only the four at Howarth are lit. It would be terrific to have other lit courts at night. Um, you know, Rotard Park is pulled way ahead of us in putting in a bunch of new pickleball courts. They're uh, higher quality, and when they start having statewide or national tournaments there and uh, or league play, people from around the county, around the state, and around the country are going to go there and spend their money there and not in Santa Rosa. We need to uh, catch up. Windsor's putting in new courts also. We need to catch up in Santa Rosa, especially per our population, 
in the number of people here who are now playing pickleball. It grows and it grows and it grows the population of pickleball players. We need improved and uh, increased number of pickleball facilities. So I'm more advocating here than asking questions. Um, and I, I ditto on the uh, comments about needing lit courts, just like the lit fields are necessary. Lit courts are necessary for the students and the workers in Santa Rosa who play pickleball after in the evenings. So thank you for your time. That's all I had to say. Thank you, Teo. Our next speaker is James Elliott. James, I am enabling your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. State your name for the record if you so choose and your time begins now. Thank you so much. This is James Elliott, uh, parent and board member at San Rosa United Soccer. Um, as of today, I'm a Windsor resident. By tomorrow, hopefully if the moving company shows up on time, we'll be Santa Rosa residents. You know, what we really need are lit multi-sport fields. You know, I'm, I'm a soccer parent. That's clear, clearly something that, that I know that we need. But in being a soccer parent of, an, of a kid who actively plays and traveling both within our, within our local county and seeing all the other, you know, turf, lit turf fields, and not, a, not, not opposed to saying traveling to other counties and seeing the massive facilities they, they have that are multi-sport, all weather and lit, you know, now is more example than ever that we need our kids outside in fresh air doing healthy activities. My question that I would like to post is, I guess, because I'm curious as to the, all of the open field at a place to play on the south side of the parking lot, where there looks like there's ample room for another couple of turf sized fields of soccer, which would be highly um, removed from residential. Seems like an ideal spot to me to be looking to put in some all-weather turf fields. I'm not sure if, um, if we could get baseball, soccer, football fields at that same spot, but I, I know that we need to do that. Um, I think we need to focus these development dollars on youth sports. Uh, well, well, I think that's you know, the most important thing, and that's what I have to say. Thank you, James. Thank you. Our I can jump in and answer that question really quickly. The city did has put an application in to the Sonoma County Ag and Open Space District um, to complete the um, remaining fields to be installed at a place to play. And if that is able to move forward, we're looking at two uh, multi-use fields at a place to play in that area. So hopefully we can hopefully we can get that grant and move forward with that. But stay tuned. Do, do you know if that's lighting is available as part of that plan, or that is yet to be figured out? It it would have to be figured out. Yeah. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kevin Kilroy. Kevin, I'm enabling your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. State your name for the record if you so choose, and your time begins now. Uh, hey guys, uh, Kevin Kilroy is my name. Um, I am not originally from the area. I'm from Ireland originally, moved here a number of, about three, four years ago. I'm director of soccer operations with St. Rose United. So a couple of the previous speakers, uh, I know them well. Um, I share the same opinion as them. Um, I share the same opinion as the, the, the the, some of the other speakers, I think that when I moved to the area first, I said the biggest need when I spoke to people at the time was lit fields in Santa Rosa. Lit fields, number one, all, all weather fields, number two, you know. Um, I think somebody mentioned earlier futsal. I know futsal is a growing sport as well. It's, it's an extension of soccer. They're not grass. They're not, um, you know, they're, there's courts just being built in Roner Park. Or lower cost option also that that would be number three for me but uh, I, I my questions would be um in the in, in when considering the investment is there any consideration for a return on investment so like building a multi-use facility will bring millions of tax millions of dollars to santa rosa and the question i would have is you know is there any consideration given to that you know that the investment would would yield a significant return to the businesses in the in the area and to the community at large. That's my first uh, question. And then my second question was just, again, it's ROI related. 
um, and place to play is would be a, a great area I think for the full city of Santa Rosa and the question I have there is like has there been consideration given to convert the existing fields to turf you know uh, it would I'd imagine reduce the cost on maintenance perhaps on having to, to cut the grass fields and and other maintenance that is involved in, in, in that area. And just the final comment I have then would be just, um, we, we regularly receive comments from our uh, members about um, safety of the parks. Um, I think having lighted parks at night would uh, certainly increase the, the safety aspect of a lot of our city parks. So if there was a possibility to have lighted fields in the city, I think that would increase the, the safety aspect also. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. I can respond and let you know that definitely we're, nothing's off the table. Uh, we, we hope that this conversation um, tonight can spark interest. And I uh, like hearing the idea of uh, a return on investment, uh, you know, opportunities like that. And, and certainly we hope that um, the surveys that you're gonna take, we can have some of that information. You could check those boxes. And then the survey that we're going to send you separately will have the option for you to write in your ideas. And we'd love to hear from as many of you as possible about uh, these options, because um, one of the reasons we're doing this is we hear from you all quite often about what's needed. Uh, but we want to show through this data we're collecting tonight, as well as additional future meetings, um, that it's, it's not just a staff desire. It's not something we're seeing. It's something really desired from the community itself. And so um, a place to play, we, we definitely have considered converting some of those fields to artificial turf. Um, the, we'd like to see um, how, much, how far our funds will go if we are accepted for this grant to install additional fields at a place to play and how much funds we have remaining to potentially convert some of those to artificial turf. Um, so it's definitely something that's on our mind as well as um, we, we definitely recognize the need for um, lighted fields in the, in the city. So appreciate your feedback. Jen, um, Mr. Kilroy also has typed a question um, that which is what are community concerns with lighting fields? Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure, sure. It's, especially at a place to play, we've heard from neighbors that they are concerned about uh, the light pollution that is uh, potential for them. Uh, when they, you know, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of our parks are um, within existing communities that have not been accustomed to lighted fields. So uh, we will need to have further community conversations for those locations where we choose to uh, pursue lighted fields so we can help um, educate the community and um, also inviting our sports community so we can talk about some of the positive benefits you've mentioned tonight. So um, mostly it's a, it's a uh, uh, light pollution kind of complaint that we've heard so far, as well as just the additional potential noise uh, later at night uh, if there's lighted fields. Um, so that's what we're hearing uh, from folks in neighborhoods. Um, so stay tuned, uh, lots to come, <laughs> but uh, we've heard you and we definitely will look forward to having those future detailed discussions with the community about lighted fields. Thank you. Our next speaker is Safari. Safari, I'm enabling your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone, state your name for the record if you so choose and your time begins now. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Kathy Kirst, not Safari, <laughs> and I am the North Bay Pickleball Ambassador for Sonoma, Napa, and Solano Counties. My husband, Ken, has acted as the tournament director for the annual pickleball tournament at Finley Park as part of the Wine Country Senior Games the past seven years. And this tourney, uh, tourney draw, draws over 200 participants from all over California and other states. And so... We and many other pickleball players would like to see more pickleball courts built in Santa Rosa in addition to the eight that we currently have. Our local group of over 100 pickleball players feel that increasing the number of courts in Santa Rosa will increase the draw of tourists, like Teo Alexander said, 
not only at tournament time, but all year long. Many pickleball players means more revenue for the city of Santa Rosa and healthier and happier Santa Rosa citizens of all ages is a win-win scenario. All ages, not just adults and senior citizens, but children as well. We have new player, players learning the sport at Finley seven days a week with regular play nine to noon. Also at Haworth Park, play is in the mornings and in the evenings because they do have uh, lights there. So I invite Measure M decision makers to come learn our sport. We have extra paddles and many volunteers to help you learn the joy of pickleball. Please authorize funding for more courts in Santa Rosa. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Q. John, I'm enabling your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. State your name for the record if you so choose and your time begins now. Good evening, my name is John Quinn. I am president of Santa Rosa Youth Soccer League. I'm past president of Santa Rosa United. I'm president of Sonoma Soccer Complex. Uh, we operate uh, the two all other soccer fields at Shoffland Park. So I think there's a great, great need for light at all weather fields here. I mean, we were late adopters of the existing fields that are in our community. Um, most of those fields are at high schools and frankly are unavailable to community users. Um, if you looked at, at Petaluma, which I'm not saying is the best example, they're a third our size and have four lighted all weather fields, uh, public fields. You know, at that basis, we should have at least 12 here that were, you know, municipal fields. Um, you know, I think if we went to other communities such as Danville, you'd find for, you know, Danville is about our size community. And I, I don't know this, I haven't checked. They've got a ton of light, uh, lighted in, in all weather fields there. So, you know, we're way behind where we should be. But in addition to that, Nate, which is acute, in the long, long run, and, and secondary to lighted full-size fields, I think we would be well served to consider um, all-weather mini pitches, lighted all-weather mini pitches. You can put them in neighborhood parks. You can make this recreation opportunity available, you know, without having to jump in your car and drive to the other side of town. It, you know, there's lots of um, neighborhood parks, community parks that have more than ample space to put in a, you know, 40,000 square foot or a 20,000 square foot pitch that, you know, the community could use. And it'd be a great asset to the community. From the community's perspective, I think it'd be fair to say the full size fields and complexes are a higher priority. Uh, and we, are, we have a great need for those. But secondarily, we ought to look at um, neighborhood parks and what we could do with those to serve the community. So um, I think you know, the soccer community is pretty clear in their need. Uh, I've spent, you know, Kevin and I have spent a significant amount of time in recent weeks trying to track down available fields in the county. And it, it is just impossible right now. Um, you know, we, it's, it is an embarrassment that the county seat, that the largest community in county doesn't have these resources. Uh, and I, with that, I would yield back the rest of my time. Thank you, John. Our next speaker is Adam Brand. Adam, I'm enabling your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. State your name for the record if you so choose and your time begins now. Hi, my name is Adam Brand. I'm the president of Santa Rosa United Soccer Club. And I first wanna start by saying thank you for um, giving this opportunity to ask questions and to provide uh, our input about what is needed in Santa Rosa. Um, I've been a resident of Santa Rosa for the last eight years. I originally grew up in, in outside of Dallas, Texas and spent a lot of time in Florida. And I will say one of the first things I noticed when I started getting into youth sports with my kids here is the astounding lack of, of lighted fields. Uh, that was noticeable immediately and not just for soccer which obviously i'm here to advocate for but for all sports 
So I, I fully support the comments from the gentleman from the Rincon Valley uh, Youth Baseball League and the, the two speakers for, the, for representing pickleball that there is a, a desperate need here in this community for, for lighted fields and um, courts of all kinds. So I'd love to see that for, for all sports users. Um, another thing that is, is noticeable here is how we have fallen behind the other communities within our county and other communities across the state in regards to number of fields, number of all weather fields and number, and number of lighted fields. Uh, I echo a lot of the comments from everyone else that I believe Santa Rosa can and needs to do better for our community and providing these facilities for not only for youth sports, which uh, is what I am here representing, but I, I do think if you would find if there were lighted you know, fields that people of all ages would be taking, taking them into account and would be using them as much as possible from, a, you know, as the adult pickleball players are talking about. I also think you might see adult baseball or softball leagues. And yeah, I, I know for a fact you would see adult soccer leagues. And these are things that the, that the, uh, the city is losing out on and generating revenue. Um, not to mention the ability to add futsal courts, which uh, I was very excited to see Roner Park put in, but also a little dismayed that we're falling behind Roner Park in that aspect as well. Um, just to add one more comment regarding the uh, return on investment that Kevin Kilroy mentioned earlier. Um, one of the things that San Diego has seen, and, and I know we're nowhere near that size, but with, with the COVID pandemic, is the loss of Surf Cup to that community is, that's their second largest um, community event that brings in the most dollars behind Comic-Con in, in a city like, like San Diego. So if we were able to provide more all-weather fields and more lighted fields, you would see the kind of revenue brought back into this community from tournaments for not just soccer, which would also obviously be a big driver, but all these other sports that people have been talking about. People would love to come to wine country and, and have access to high quality fields that they'd be able to, to play on for these tournaments. So again, thank you for your time and for allowing us to speak and just again, wanna advocate for more lighted and all weather fields for all sports. Thank you, Adam. John Q has another question. John, I'm enabling your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. And yeah, I just, may, go ahead. I just wanted to give you a little scale. Um, youth soccer players in Santa Rosa are probably 4,000 kids in a typical year. And it's hard to say what a typical year is between COVID-19 and fires. And I've, I've undertaken an effort to find uh, the data from two years ago to get some scale of what the community is, but between our registrations in Santa Rosa Youth Soccer League and uh, what I know the other comp programs in the community have, easy 4,000 kids playing organized soccer. And there's many, many thousands of kids who don't have an opportunity to play. And part of the reason they don't have the opportunity is lack of facilities. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to say is, um, and it's, it's been raised by baseball as well, there's a great advantage to having clustered facilities that give you opportunities to have uh, people travel from out of our area to our area for events. Um, you know, it, it, there's probably more value in a four field facility than four one field facilities. And so, uh, you know, that's something that I think we ought to consider in our planning. Uh, but, you know, as I said in my example earlier with the uh, relative lack of fields here and uh, the number that have seemed appropriate for Petaluma or for Danville, you know, we're not gonna find places to put 10 field facilities very easily but maybe we can do a four or five or six field facility one way and then do four other fields around town. But, you know, we've got a long way to go to get what this community needs. And, you know, the other argument I would make is if we're going to build lots of facilities over say five or 10 years or whatever the time frame is, we ought to have a plan to have more single sport fields in addition to multi-sport fields because it's gonna be a lot easier to uh, utilize efficiently space and investment on single sport fields than it is on multi-sport fields. And I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you, John. 
We have another question from Derek Huntington. Derek, I'm asking you to unmute your microphone. I'm enabling your speaking permissions. You may go ahead. Yeah, uh, definitely appreciate um, John and everybody from the, the soccer side's perspective um, and support of, of the baseball as well. Again, echoing that comment, um, you know, about multiple fields at, sa at the same time. Um, and, and also additional, you know, some uh, like specialty, in some cases, uh, sport specific uh, spots like, like batting cages and other things that allow, uh, you know, kind of a higher level of play or a higher level of tournament to be available at that location. Uh, you know, place to play does have facilities as a batting cage, but uh, it tends to be, you know, kind of not at the, the level um, of repair um, or just the level of quality needed uh, to really, you know, be utilized, uh, you know, for kind of a tournament level of play. So uh, considering, again, those sport specific needs um, to make the facilities really functional for those high level events. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Madam Facilitator, I see no other hands at this time. There are two, um, oh, actually three questions um, in the Q&A uh, feature. Um, one is from James Elliott. There have been lots, well, I guess it's a comment. There have been lots of improvements with LED lighting, which produces drastically less pollution than traditional lights. Um, from Adam Brand, since light pollution has been raised as a concern for providing lighting at existing parks within communities, has there been any consideration to new field complexes in areas that are not within existing neighborhoods? Yes, and I just want to thank James uh, for the comment. I agree that the latest LED technology is much better than uh, every year than what, we've, what we traditionally look at. And we are looking at areas outside existing neighborhoods for potential uh, for new complexes um, at all times. So if you have any ideas, we're all ears. Uh, we do try to keep an eye on that as well. If you rem remember the map that we showed that showed the new, uh, the little red trees, that's available from the general plan. Um, or you can contact me and I can get you. Those are the areas where uh, the city has identified potential new parks. It doesn't mean that it's limited to that. So we always have our eyes and ears open for potential options. Although uh, the funding may not be there, we do still try to look for those options and um, consider them when they come up. And then it looks like we have another question. Is that right? Yes, the, the last question is, are you planning on hosting a Spanish language, um, one of these um, public meetings, um, and we are planning to have a Spanish one um, in, in the southwest quadrant or have a translator um, on hand at a meeting in early 2021. It won't be sports focused, but um, certainly those questions can be asked there um, as well. Do you have anything to add, Jen? Right, and I would just remind everyone that as we roll through some of the polling and we send you the survey, if there is a really strong desire to have an exclusively Spanish component as part of the sports conversation, we can certainly look at that too uh, as an option instead of waiting until um, next year for the uh, Spanish only version. So keep us posted and let us know what is important to you so we can uh, we can flex and, and make that available as needed. Okay, are we going to get, we're going to roll back to our regular presentation in just a minute. And then we check my location. We're going to roll into some polling and Rochelle's going to walk us through that. It's going to be sports specific. Uh, just keeping in mind that um, the polling is limited to yes or no or the uh, multiple choice options we have. Um, but that at the end of this will be um, after this meeting, we'll be sending you a separate survey where you'll have the option to type in responses and return them to us. Um, if what our options are for your response doesn't meet your needs. 
So I'll turn it over to Rochelle to walk us through the questions. Rochelle, you're muted. So can you hear me now? Yes. So um, we got our question and answers done ahead of time. So that's great. Um, now the poll, um, when you go through these, just um, you can think of it as, you know, answer it within your sport or you can answer it with all the sports in mind. It's kind of up to you. Um, just, just letting you know, it's okay to just do your own sport and uh, there will be options for people throughout the year, the rest of the year to um, do these same things. They'll be sent out as well. Okay. Um, to, oh, there. Okay, next slide, please. Rochelle, are you able to see the questions to, to read them or uh, can I go through that for you? Do you oh, mind? Yeah. I, yeah, go ahead. I don't have those. Okay, no problem. I, I know some screens, it's not always evident. Uh, but this is just like our last one for any of those of you um, taking this polling and we hope you do take this poll. The responses are really, really important. I mean, we absolutely love hearing your opinions and information you have. It's, it's fantastic, but the polling is really important. So uh, number one, how many more athletic fields and sport courts does Santa Rosa need? And as Rochelle mentioned, it's, it's look at your sport and think about it. We, we know we're not getting super nitty gritty detail, but we just want to get a sense of the, the larger need. Um, and number two, what kind of servicing should new athletic fields be made of? Um, and so there you have an option for the all weather, weather artif artificial or both or, or anything like that. And then number three, should new athletic fields have lighting? <laughs> I think I know what the response will probably be there. Um, and then number four, should new sport courts have lighting as well? And, um, and if you're ahead of me or behind me, that's fine. Just kind of rolling through them for those of you that are on the phone. Uh, what is the minimum number of athletic fields that need to be grouped together to accommodate tournaments? So think of your particular sport on an athletic field. What would be, um, what would be your, your ultimately number one choice to have? And then number six, what is the minimum number of sports courts that need to be grouped together to accommodate a tournament? So we're looking at um, pickleball, tennis, basketball, you know, sport court type of um, handball, things like that. And um, for number seven, for a tournament held in Santa Rosa, what is the maximum distance between clusters of parks with fields or courts that you are willing to travel to, to participate in a tournament or game. And um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Rochelle, but I, I know when we were talking previously, um, it was, you know, it's one of those things where if you have to run two different youth to two different sports or you're traveling from Sonoma State and have to rush inside to Santa Rosa, what is that, you know, what is that distance that, um, you'd be willing to, to travel um, to participate in a tournament. Do you have anything else? I don't know if I'm messing that up, Rochelle, if you have anything better to no. say. <laughs> I, think, I think also remember Santa Rosa is um, congested at times. And so even if it might be five miles, it may take you longer than the, the hour between the games. Um, there's always, uh, so you, you have to kind of look at, you know, where you, what you'd be willing to go do. Back in the day, again, we, we did go from Sonoma State to uh, Franklin and we went, went from, uh, you know, Galvin all over town, but uh, there was a lot less congestion and it was a problem and you can't get your volunteers back and forth. You can't get your referees back and forth. It's, it's a problem that way. So kind of think of all of those. And I would imagine when I played tennis, um, it was only useful to just go to your one set place and not travel. Okay, that's, that's, that's perfect. That's what I was looking for is that explanation of that, um, that 
So think about that in that terms and what would be your absolute best case scenario. We know <laughs> we might think this may be ultimately different, but um, what are we shooting for here? That's what we'd like to know. And then number eight, if the city can only spend money on maintaining the fields and courts it has or building new fields and courts, which would you prefer? And we ask this question because we hear a lot saying, well, if you can't do this, then at least maintain what you have. And so let us know what you think is the preference for that, um, if you just had to choose. <laughs> and then number nine, would you prefer the city spend money to convert current fields to all weather lit fields or build new all weather lit fields? Again, that's one of those scenarios, again, where you we're kind of forcing a choice. What would be your absolute preference um, if you had to be making a choice there? And then let's see, number 10, do you prefer multi-purpose fields or courts or single purpose fields and courts? Um, and there's some examples, adult tennis, youth tennis and pickleball and soccer, baseball, softball, and rugby can kind of be shared between them. And we heard some opinions there. So definitely tell us what your what your preference is. And then I don't know, Rochelle, if you have anything else to add about this section when we're asking, we have another, another set of questions for you too, but it's so important that we gather this data and I can't thank you all enough for participating in this. I'm, I'm yeah, that's fine. It is, it is really important. And I'm gonna say it again, the city council needs backup and there's no way for the, Parks and Recreation Department to just put a lot of information together. The proof is, is us. It's us going to meetings of the council. It's us also writing to them. It's us providing them with these um, poll information. And it's us going to the, even the commissions, um, you know, just having representations there and saying, saying this over and over again. It's, it's how a place to play got built. You know, I can tell you, we, we, took probably 80 kids in uniform down to City Hall. And uh, it was really impressive and important. And I think it finally um, made a, a dent in their, in their idea of what these kids were waiting for. All right. Um, I'll turn it over to the host and see about where we're at. I know that's a long one. Um, how are we doing with the polling? We have 16 of 19 reporting. All right, we'll just give it a little bit more time there and check back in in just a second or two. It doesn't appear to be changing. Okay, all right, well, let's check those results. All right, there we go. So let's see, let's go through number one, how many more athletic fields and sport courts does Santa Rosa need? It's kind of a, it's relatively even, that looks like 20 to 30 is leading the charge there. Um, and number two, what kind of surfacing should new athletic fields be made of? Uh, there's a strong preference for all weather, artificial turf. And should new athletic fields have lighting, 88% uh, uh, looking at yes. And we have some uh, with no opinion or uh, could be both lit or not. And then uh, number four, should new sport courts have lighting, 81% yes. And number five, what is the minimum number of athletic fields that need to be grouped together to accommodate tournaments? Looks like there's um, a stronger preference for five to eight, 44 percent, and uh, with two to five, 
at 25%. And then if we look at number six, uh, same question for sport courts. We're looking at, again, five, yeah, five to eight, same thing at 31% there. And then we've got about 31, same amount uh, with no opinion. And then for number seven, we're looking at clustering fields together. What is the maximum distance you're willing to travel? And we've got folks looking at 15 miles as um, the preference for or the, the winner, so to speak, with the, a maximum amount of time they'd be willing to spend to travel inside Santa Rosa. And let's see. And then our question number eight, if the city can only spend money on maintaining the fields and courts it has or building new fields and courts, the preference is building new fields and courts, 69%. Uh, and then for not, number nine, would you prefer the city spend money to convert fields to all weather lit fields or build new all weather lit fields? And 50% doing both is beneficial. Let's see, and the final question, do you prefer multi-purpose fields and courts or single purpose fields and courts? And um, the strongest answer is having both is beneficial. So that's perfect. Thank you so much for taking that poll. It really helps us um, understand what we think we knew and hopefully learn and learned a few new things as well. Um, it's, you know, like Rochelle said, it's really, really important that when we collect the data um, we can use that to help um, structure how we move forward with the funding as well as how we have conversations at council when there is other funds available. And I am going to look to the hosting team because I know this is a lot to try to capture and see if we need a little bit more time. I've captured what I've needed. Okay, great. All right, let's roll on to the next, next slide. And so the next bit of questions we're going to ask is um, just checking here about maintenance. And so uh, we wanted to have a... Actually, we, um, we have a continuation of the... Uh, specific poll. That's right. We did make a change there. So I apologize. We have a little bit of a continuation of the same questioning we had before. Um, so I, um, I'm going to roll into these and again, appreciate your patience. I know this is a lot, but it's so, so helpful for us uh, when we're looking at storytelling. So go ahead and start um, placing your information in there, your votes. So number one, how far are you willing to travel to access an all-weather lit field for practice or game? So this is an area um, outside maybe even the city. So we've got zero to five at the bottom and then 25 miles on the next um, and then no opinion. And then number two, are there any sports that should be brought to Santa Rosa? We've heard, uh, we've heard a little bit today about some of that. Um, uh, but there are certainly other sports that we think, you know, we're trying to think outside the box here and what could be brought to uh, the city of Santa Rosa, like we've heard futsal today. And so even though you may not see futsal here today, you'll have the opportunity to write that in, um, in the survey we're going to email to you after this, after this um, meeting. And then um, currently, number three, currently only schools have gyms in Santa Rosa. Should Measure M funding be used to design and construct a city gymnasium somewhere? So I'd just like to see what you have to think about that. And uh, number four, should Measure M funding be used to design and construct a new aquatic a center? And so um, we have, you know, we have our two aquatic centers, Ridgeway and Finley. And we hear from time to time that there's a, a, a need for additional aquatic centers. And number five, should the funding for Measure M be used to design and construct a new community center, uh, which could have a variety of things in it, something maybe not as small as Steel Lane, but on, on, this, on that same line, 
where we have a variety of things in a community center um, together, maybe like another Finley. Um, and number six, what types of dedicated funding mechanisms for parks would you support after Measure M Parks for All ends? So um, this does have an end date in 2029. Um, and we're looking at other alternative options. What would you uh, be willing to support? And just curious what you might have to think about that. Let's see. And I don't know, Rochelle, I don't know if we talked a lot about these particular questions, but if you have anything to add, certainly feel free if there's anything to, to add to that. No, I think that's, um, that's good. Yeah, all, even though we just got started with Measure M, um, I think it's important to recognize it does have an end date and you do have to, we have to maintain. We all know what happened when maintenance wasn't happening to many of our fields about, about eight years ago. And um, it, it's, it looks a lot better now, but it, it did take a big toll when monies were not coming into the maintenance department. Um, the only thing I want to ask you, if this happened at the last meeting, um, is the maintenance for the medians um, and the street medians and um, street corners and things like that, are, are those also under the maintenance budget? Yes, so the city, those are the city's responsibility. Yes, so all of the medians in the middle of the street and then any of the right of ways that are adjacent to public land. So in front of and adjacent to the street, for instance, on a place to play, all that frontage there would be the city's responsibility. But on the other side, where it's residential units, those are um, the residents are responsible for that. So yeah, it's, it's quite a big variety of, of um, responsibility for the, for the maintenance team. And we do have a contractor that is doing some work right now, uh, mowing and blowing um, turf and fields and things like that, because uh, that's something we can do without um, without the um, without the need for chemicals. Because we still have an outstanding question from the council about uh, what is the community's preference, which is part of this conversation tonight as well. Yes. For chemicals. Yeah. Jen, can you um, explain the difference between a park tax district, um, re, let's see, um, park development impact fees renew and renewing measure M? Sure, sure. Now that's a great question. So a parks tax district is something we don't have a lot of right now. Uh, we could think of as a parks tax district that would be um, uh, something new for the city where all of the city's um, responsibilities for recreation parks would be under a district and there'd be funding dedicated to just that district. So that's one way of thinking about it. We have very small tax districts right now where some of the right of way roadways and things like that are placed into special tax districts. Um, where we have special funds dedicated for just that purpose for only maintaining that tax district. Um, so there's two ways of thinking about that. Um, the other thing, the park development impact fees are the fees that we collect per quadrant in the city when a, a residential subdivision or residential housing goes in. Uh, the city collects fees per quadrant from those uh, and in holding in a holding uh, pattern to build future parks with those fees. Uh, and then renew measure M that's something we're already talking about even though measure M just start got started should we ask the uh, residents of the county to extend and renew measure M after it, it ends. So that's something we're also thinking that this is so awesome. This is such a great source of, of revenue for parks and recreation. Um, should we renew it. So hopefully that helps a little bit with the, with the explanation. Jen, could you also um, talk about the amount of, the number of maintenance staff um, that the city had before um, the economic recession and um, what we have today, just to um, manage expectations? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. G great question. Uh, we, the city maintained a, a relatively hefty amount, about 50 park maintenance staff uh, for 
um, about a thousand acres and before 2008 and after the economic downturn we have 18 uh, park maintenance staff members which include supervisors as well uh, for the entire city and at both times we had um, we had a, um, a contract service for some, main, some maintenance to happen as well. Uh, but after 2008, we tried to rely a little bit more on the contract service. Uh, so that was the focus after 2008. This may be, this is another question um, that was raised in the Q&A feature. And it may be best for Amy to answer. Could any new or existing sports courts be multi-purpose for basketball, tennis, and futsal? I would say we'd have to look into that, but I, um, I don't know if Amy has anything else to add. Um, that's certainly, it seems like it's possible. <laughs> um, I don't know if Amy was able to stay on with us if you have anything else to add. Yeah, if you want. Hi, everybody. No, I, I don't. The sports courts are, are not an area that I'm real familiar with. Um, I use, I know that they're kind of doing multi-course for pickleball and tennis, and that doesn't seem to work. It works, but it's not ideal for that group. Right, thank you. Thank you. We'll look more into that. All right. Was there anything else before we look at our results? Um, there's just there's a comment about um, using money um, to take care of the turf fields. Um, Um, because they're being, they're not in good shape and also um, transient people are using them for camping and leaving lots of trash um, and just e considering using money for from Measure M in order to maintain the fields to keep them safe for everyone, but especially the children. Okay. All right, great. So I will close the poll, 100% of respondents have answered. And here's the results. Great. Okay, let's look at this. So for question number one, how far are you willing to travel to access an all weather lit field for practicing games? Um, looks like five to 10 and 10 to 15, 29%, uh, both of those trailing behind by 15 to 25 miles. And then number two, are there any sports that should be brought to Santa Rosa? It looks like we had uh, quite a few selected. Um, looks like I'm looking forward to maybe getting some responses back from that future survey on others because we had 36% at other, uh, but certainly BMX, indoor tennis, lacrosse, track and field, roller hockey, indoor pickleball um, were also selected. And then for number three, currently only schools have gyms in Santa Rosa. Should Measure M funding be used to design and construct a city gymnasium? And 57% uh, no, and 36% yes on that. And it says number four is should Measure M funding be used to design and construct a new aquatic center? And looking at 64% no and 21% yes on that one. And let's see, for number five, should Measure M funding be used to design and construct a new community center? 71% uh, no, and 29% yes. And then let's look at the last question. Uh, the types of funding after Measure M runs out. Um, looks like there's support for renewing Measure M. Glad to hear, and also some uh, support for uh, districting. So really great information, um, especially like hearing about all of the new types of sports that should come to our community. It's always exciting to hear. Um, I remember actually the first time I heard about pickleball coming to the city and um, really excited to hear what it was and how it was being played. That's a, a, a new one in, uh, for me. So I'll look to the host now to see um, 
there's anything else we need to do it, uh, or we can, can we close this res, uh, results or uh, do we need a little more time to capture the information? I have the information. Thank you. Great. Yay. All righty. So we're going to move on now. And I think some of you are getting ahead of us, which is fantastic, to looking into uh, maintenance options and what we have out there. And so we just wanted to give you a reminder to get your brain thinking about the maintenance of the uh, sports and athletic fields and amenities we have out there. So we, the team does maintain all of the irrigation systems throughout the city. We manage the pests and weeds. And um, we want you to think about that because that's one of the questions that the council would like to know from the community is what sort of support do you have for uh, pests and weed removal, either using chemicals or organic chemicals, not organic, uh, mechanical means or um, other, other options for removing pests and weeds. Of course, we mow, a, we mow, edge, and blow the fields, infields, and outfields. Uh, we do rely on our volunteers heavily for that. Uh, but the parks maintenance team does uh, that as well as our recreation staff get involved from time to time. Uh, tr empty the trash. Of course, we pick up trash. We replace nets. We stripe and chalk fields. Um, and of course, we coordinate with all of our fantastic volunteer groups out there. Um, I know this, this city in particular relies really heavily on its uh, successful volunteer program. So let's, let's see, where are we at? We have another poll to do. And this one is to ask you questions about how we're doing with maintenance and how you think we can do better or what things are we doing right. So let's take a look at this poll and really appreciate you stick, sticking around. I know this is a lot to cover, uh, but it's so, so important. So number one, is the city doing a good job maintaining its current athletic fields and sports courts it owns? Um, and so number two, how much time does your organization spend taking care of Santa Rosa's facilities, fields, courts, nets, chalking, things like that? We know we have um, some fantastic groups out there that are doing an amazing amount of work each week. And so even if it's not physically you, um, let us know what you know, what you see out there happening. Um, it's really important, even outside of the athletic community, we do have a huge volunteer program uh, in the city helping out at many parks. And then number three, how do you feel about the length of the grass in the athletic fields? We have heard some interesting feedback about this, so we thought we'd add this just for you all, just for our sports and athletic groups. Um, so take a look at that. We've got, is the length too long? The length is too short, or it's just right, or maybe there's no opinion. So take a look at that. And then we have number four, what sort of pest control would you be in favor of? And so we have the mechanical, you know, this think of gopher holes, we would um, tamp those down um, as well as we have a type of poison that is used for um, chemical removal of gophers and sports fields. And we also trap, uh, we also trap the gophers as well. And so those three options um, are in use in the city right now. And uh, they, uh, just a reminder to you all, those never happen during the playing season. Those are always happening, except the um, sometimes will mechanical removal of the gopher holes during the season. But the, the chemical use of chemicals happens outside the playing season. And if we can't do it outside the play, playing season, they're not used. So just wanted to give you an idea of what's happening there. And so we added that a mix of all of these would kind of get us to where we're at right now. Um, number five, how concerned are you with weeds in athletic fields and on sport courts? So just trying to get a sense of what you're okay with. Um, no weeds or it's okay to see some or as long as they don't impact your use of the of the field or court. And then number six, what level of weed control do you think is acceptable in athletic fields and sports courts. Um, and so um, the number five was um, your concern level and number six is an exact question. I don't wanna see any weeds or it's okay to see some weeds. Um, and then number seven, 
to achieve the level of aesthetic weed control you noted above for athletic fields and courts, would you support using Measure M funds um, to get there? Because for instance, if we wanted to see no weeds, uh, we would need to use additional funding from somewhere. And would you support using Measure M funds for additional maintenance? And number eight, should herbicides be used on athletic fields and sport courts to suppress weeds? So um, there's two types of herbicides. There's, we have the traditional chemical and we also have the organic chemical. So the organic one is an all natural material. The, the chemical one is, is a derivative of those. So think about that um, and just keep in mind that also if chemicals are used anywhere around a sports field or court, they're used outside of the playing season if that's possible um, or not used at all if we can't accomplish that on youth, um, especially on youth uh, fields. And number nine, our final question, should pesticides be used on athletics, athletic fields to deter pests? So I know there's a lot to think about, but um, it's really important that we hear from you and what's important to you, especially um, your use of the fields and gopher holes. Um, there are some communities that have opted out of using uh, chemical means and they do tend to attract more gophers um, during the during the season. And I don't know, Rochelle uh, or Amy, if you have anything else to add to that. Oh, Rochelle, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. We don't wanna have our kids breaking ankles, um, which has happened and, or arms and things. And so it's an issue, but um, it's also an issue to not have them be any more inundated to health hazards than we've already got them going with these fires and weather and everything else that's um, they're impacted with. So it's a dilemma. <laughs> yeah. I'll add it's probably one of the number one complaints we receive is the gopher holes and cracks in the and the turf and the twisted ankles and concern for safety there. Um, which could be solved if it was all weather fields because then you usually minimize the gophers. Uh, don't burrow and if it's not real grass. Great point, thank you both. Great points for that. Um, all right, so I'll look to our host to see how we're doing with this questioning to see if everyone's had a chance to finish. Yes, we have 12 of 13 reporting, so. Okay. All right, great, thank you. Let's look at the results. Okay, great. So is the city doing a good job and <laughs> kind of splitting things there, yes, no, and unsure uh, with maintenance? And the number two, it looks like um, we've got uh, one to five hours a week uh, for organizations spending the amount of, you know, the most amount of time, one to five hours Next is 17% five to 10 hours a week and 25% 10 plus hours a week. So definitely got some vo great volunteers out there. And then we asked about the length of the uh, grass and athletic fields and it looks like the preference is the length is too long and that it needs to be mowed shorter for 50% of the respondents. Others like it just the way it is at 17%. And then what kind of pest control would you be in favor of? Um, a mix of all of these, 42% followed. It looks like an equal of mechanical and physical and less 8% uh, for chemical. And let's see, number five, how concerned are you with weeds and athletic fields and sport courts? There's a 42% of you are okay as long as they don't impact the use of the park or safety and 33% don't wanna see any weeds and 17% say it's okay as long as some, if there's some weeds. And number six, I think uh, what, what level of weed control is acceptable in athletic fields? 50% uh, don't wanna see any weeds there and 33 okay as long as they don't impact similar as the other question. And number seven, to achieve a little level of aesthetic weed control you noted above, would you support using Measure M funds? So yes, looks like is favored there at 42%.
And number eight, should herbicides be used on athletic fields and sport courts to suppress weeds? There's a preference for yes at 42% with yes, but only organic herbicides, number 33, uh, 33% uh, with no at 17%. And should pesticides be used on athletic fields to deter pest? Um, the preference was yes, but only organic pesticides at 42% and 25% um, yes and 25% no. So thank you all very much for participating. And um, I know this is lengthy. We just have one more, one more tiny section to go through. Um, and I'm going to look to our host to see if we have collected all of that information. Yes, thank you. All right, great. Jen, there is one question um, related to maintenance before we move on um, from Adam Brand. What about the maintenance cleaning of restroom facilities? Right, so our, that's a great question. Our maintenance staff is responsible for cleaning park restrooms and it usually happens once a day at least or like at Howarth Park where we have um, a lot of activities going on um, and especially when we have recreation programming going on there can be additional cleanings two or three times a day but most parks receive once a day cleaning of the restroom facilities thank you all right let's Let's talk about Measure M. So we do want to ask you some traditional questions here that may not have a ton to do with sports, uh, but it'll help us get a, a final, this is our final poll <laughs> to ask you about how we should use these funds. And this is a really important one because this is where we're going to ask you, what is your preference of all of those areas for spending? Um, and hopefully we can help you, guide you to look at those. And if you do have a preference for sports, you can uh, notify that on there. So let's roll into the next slide, please. Uh, just a quick reminder of the parks. And we've got the four quadrants there. Um, and we've got 109 different parks out there. Next slide. And so we're looking at park systems by the number. So as I mentioned, 109 parks overall, we've got all those different types of parks listed there. Um, this group is probably most familiar with the community and neighborhood parks. It's our standard parks that are out there. And the city does maintain over a thousand acres. Next slide, please. And here's a, a, a quick look. And I, I recognize that we do have some errors in some of this data. Uh, but again, it's, it's mostly used to try to get you thinking about the types of sports that we do have in the city and, and generally um, how many. And we might be off on some of those counts a little bit, but that gives you a good sense of, of where we're at. And if you look at the amenities overall, we have over 200 different types of amenities um, listed there. And we've highlighted in blue some of the things that are more sports related or more traditionally thought of as sports related anyway. <laughs> Um, so let's look at the next uh, next slide. Okay, that's right. We do have uh, one more opportunity. If there's any questions about Measure M itself, we're going to ask you a bunch of questions about Measure M next. So if you have any questions that maybe you need to get answers to before we roll into the last poll <laughs> and the last slide, uh, we wanted to check in with you. So I'll turn it back over to our host to check in with our uh, participants one last time. There is one hand raised at this time, um, and it's been raised for a while. Okay. Now there are, are two. Um, I will put up the public comment slide, and Mary Lou will facilitate public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Our speaker is John Q. John, uh, you may begin. I, I just wanted to comment on one of the questions in your questionnaire. Um, you had asked whether it was better to have 
grouped facilities for a tournament or event or dispersed facilities. And <clears throat> I'll just tell you my experience and it's, it's over, you know, 15 or 20 years of doing this stuff. I think back in the day, 15 years ago, you'd go to an event and they'd, you'd be using school fields all over their community to do the event. Nowadays, and, and I'd invite Kevin or Josh, if they're still on, particularly Josh, because he's been at this a long time in, in this area. Um, nowadays, if you go to a better event or a bigger event, uh, you tend to have very closely grouped fields at one or two sites. And, and that was just the extent of my comment on that. And, and I'd invite Josh to comment if he's still on. We actually have another speaker um, prior to Josh, um, Kevin Kilroy. You may begin. Kevin. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, my question was just in relation to Measure M and the, just the overall process and what it looks like, you know, um, you know, how many, you know, what's the, I guess, what's the start and end date of, of whatever projects come up or is there any, is there any information on that available now? Sure, thank, thank you so much. Um, um, it, it is a 10 year tax uh, measure. And so we're in finishing up year two in the tax measure and it does end in 2029. And where we're at in the process is that council has approved us to go back out to the community as well as the first two years of funding to be spent on fire related damages. And then we're gonna go back in spring with the information we've collected tonight and the information we're gonna collect at future meetings um, to update the council on where the community's priorities lay to spend these funds. So I anticipate that by June of next year when we do the budget cycle, um, that we'll have some understanding of where the priorities should be for Measure M spending. And at that point, we will have a launching point for um, conducting improvements or um, adding additional maintenance or whatever comes out of this process or a combination thereof. And then we have those eight years to complete whatever that is. Uh, if it's an improvement, we have eight years to get it done. And if it's additional maintenance, that can be implemented fairly quickly um, uh, with, with those processes there on a limited uh, basis because the, the measure does have an end date um, so hopefully it gives you a sense of, of, what's, of what's coming. It is a long measure, but we want to make sure since there isn't um, a lot, uh, even though 1.2 million or $1.9 million is a lot of money um, in the scheme of things, building a new soccer field, for instance, is um, cost about one and a half million dollars to build. So um, we, that's why we wanted to get a sense of priorities from, from this group of you that are so heavily engaged in our athletic community and where those priorities might lay. Um, in addition to um, the deferred maintenance or um, condition assessment we're gonna be doing as well. So we're gonna combine all of that stuff, go back to council and hope to have some direction from council by June of 2021 for what our next steps might be. So hopefully that's helpful. Sorry about the long answer. Thank you. Our next speaker is Josh Sterling. Josh, please unmute your microphone and you may begin. Hey, uh, hello everyone again. And just a reminder, Josh Sterling, Santa Rosa United Soccer. And just to echo what John was saying, I know he wanted me to comment because I've been in the soccer world for 20 years uh, as a parent, as a coach, as a director, as a college coach. Um, so I've seen a lot of facilities in a lot of towns. And so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, we don't, I mean, soccer, you soccer at our level, we don't go to a tournament where there's not, you know, a minimum of three, probably four fields um, that are clustered together. And there's a lot of benefits for a lot of different reasons, um, regardless of the level, whether it's, you know, recreation or, or a level below ours or the highest level like ours is, 
you know, for instance, multiple fam or multiple kids playing, you're not driving all over the place, um, fundraising for the local host. So if it's San Rose United or Empire Soccer, whoever's doing the event, you're able to do sell things and, and make money and, and, and keep everyone at the same place. You can get referees they are not driving all over the place. So there's a real simplicity um, to it and an economic part to it. But as you get older, like for instance, for us, holding college showcases and college recruiting um, is a big thing. Um, I launched maybe seven or eight years ago at San Rose United, the, the college showcases. We'd bring in 50 or 60 college coaches from around the country and pack about 100 kids on each field um, for camps and then the next day do games. And that was just on two Trioni fields. So imagine what we would be able to do if we A, had more fields and B, had lights. Um, you know, it, you know, the college coaches for our kids that are trying to play college soccer in our community, um, they don't want to be driving all around our town either. Um, they'd like to be able to sit at one location or maybe two and watch all the kids that they came to see. So just sort of echoing some real life things that I've experienced over the last 20 years on why having a cluster of fields with lights and all weather fields, um, would be beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. I have no other questions here. All right, great, thank you. So we, we will roll back into our uh, presentation and this is our last poll. <laughs> thank you all so much for hanging in there. We knew it was gonna be a long one and we can't thank you enough. We know your time is super important. And uh, we have some questions for you about prioritizing the Measure M funding specifically. Um, it's, it's not just related to athletic fields, but um, you'll see how, how it goes. Um, so poll number five, how satisfied with you are the condition of the parks in Santa Rosa? So just a basic question, not necessarily targeted for athletic fields, but you can give us a sense of what your opinion is there. Uh, number two, do you feel safe when you use Santa Rosa parks. And then number three, which features of the park do you use most often? And so this is a multiple choice question. And um, these answers are related to the allowable uses um, in Measure M or the clustered uses anyway. So definitely click as many uh, that are relevant to you all in number three. And then number four, what are the most important qualities you would like to see in a park? Uh, I've got several things there to look at. Safety, aesthetics, well-maintained, well natural landscaping, ease of access, quiet spaces, themes, or a variety of amenities. Uh, so take a look at that for number four. And then number five, what existing park features would you like to see most improved in Santa Rosa? And so this being uh, about athletics, uh, we've got that as the first selection box there, if you would like to select that. Uh, and these are multiple choice, so please feel free to select as many as you like there. And a continuation of number five and six, just because we, need, <laughs> we needed more space to add in all the amenities there. Uh, so definitely click away and uh, click the ones that are uh, you would like to see most improved. And then number seven, how often do you have gatherings, events, and park facilities? And this question is obviously a pre-COVID question, uh, but let's just pretend COVID is gone. And number seven, then how many times do you gather and have events in parks? And uh, number eight, how could your city, uh, how could your city parks and recreation experience be improved? So we have some just kind of generic options there for you, better maintenance, more recreation programming, newer park amenities, more natural parks. Uh, and number nine, another multiple choice question. Uh, this is looking at recreation programs and activities. Uh, and we're curious um, if, which ones you've participated, what you're currently participating in or have participated in the past. And so we've got sports leagues as the first 
choice and youth sports. We've got um, several selections there and it's a multiple choice. And our last question of the evening, uh, which is definitely imp an important question to consider, uh, really look at those. Um, th these are exactly copied from the measure itself and their direct you know, question or their direct, direct al allowable uses. Uh, it certainly isn't exclusive, but we wanted to not mince words and we wanted to make sure we copied exactly uh, what the measure language talks about. So the first box there would be more towards maintenance. Um, the second little bubble would be more towards improving things, making new parks and new playgrounds and new athletic fields. The third uh, bubble is about expanding parks and trails and bikeways, public art. Uh, and the next one is about uh, bike paths and trails connections, uh, followed by recreation and educational programs, as well as the second to last is about reducing future fi fire uh, fuel risk. Um, and the last one is um, options for um, prioritizing the uh, waterways and riparian areas to benefit fish and wildlife. So we're looking for you to um, tell us what is important to you there. So I know that's a lot, but um, hopefully you can wade through that. And I'll look to our host, how are we doing? Oh, there we go, fantastic. So um, how satisfied are you with the condition of Santa Rosa Parks? Not satisfied at 42%. And uh, looks like we need to do a better job there. And 17% satisfied and 17 not at all. Uh, and 17 mostly satisfied. Um, do you feel safe when you visit Santa Rosa Parks? Uh, most of the time, 58%, and sometimes at 25%. And what park features do you most often use? Uh, uh, not surprisingly, 83% <laughs> athletic fields, 33% sports courts, um, playgrounds, dog parks, and swimming pools follow, follow that. And uh, number four, what are the most important qualities you would like to see in a park? I'd like to see a well-maintained at 42%, 33% want safety, and followed up by 100% athletic fields. <laughs> and um, kind of a split between the remainder of the amenities. And then number six, which features would you like to see most improved in Santa Rosa? Question number two, um, we've got trees at 17% and uh, kind of a mix of playgrounds, trails and public art and tennis. And um, pre-COVID, how many events did you have? Uh, weekly is 83%. And number eight, how could your city of Santa Rosa parks and recreation experience be improved? And so it looks like uh, new, newer park amenities at 42%, as well as better maintenance at 33%. And uh, number nine, what are your uh, city of Santa Rosa recreation programs or activities uh, are you participating in or have in the past? Youth sports, adult sports, camps, um, and golf and aquatics, quite a variety of things. And it looks like uh, for our last question on priorities, um, new fields, improvements, and things like that are the priority at 92% with a little bit about providing education and health programs for the community. All right, did our, was our, our host team able to capture those responses? Just another moment. Okay. Thank you. Um, while Mary Lou is finishing up with the results, um, there is one hand raised. Um, uh, so I'm going to let um, Michael Paul speak. Are you ready to speak, 
Michael? If so, I will um, allow you to talk and you can um, ask your question. Michael, do you have anything to say? Okay. Never mind. Okay, I've captured my information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lou. I appreciate Hello? everybody's time. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go right ahead. Hello, I'm Michael Paul. I'm with the Santa Rosa Athletics Collegiate Baseball Team. And I just wanted to say hello, happy holidays, and thank you guys for including us in this process. Great, well, thank, you. thank you so much. We're so glad that everyone was able to participate. And let's look at the next slide and look at our next steps. We'll talk about what we're gonna do next. So we kind of talked about that a little bit before, but um, after this, we have a series of three to four additional Measure M meetings. This one was specific for our sports uh, organization, so we really targeted you, but the um, meetings coming up will be more citywide, um, and we're going to try to target those quadrants that we talked about before. Um, so certainly feel free to participate that when it comes to your neighborhood. We'll be posting that information on our website when it becomes available. And we're also looking at potentially more specific meetings like this with additional city partners uh, that we work with and special interest groups. So if you know of anybody that um, that we need to talk to, uh, please let us know. And this um, this presentation, as well as the survey that we're going to send you is going to be available um, uh, to all attendees on the 7th. And we are going to run that survey through the 21st and it's going to be in an email to you um, that gives you that opportunity to type in the things that maybe um, the limitations of this sur these surveys um, don't allow you to freely express. Uh, and then, as mentioned before, we're going to collect and analyze all of this data uh, from tonight. And then we'll be returning to um, actually one little step I missed in between the Board of Community Services, which is a council appointed board. And they um, hear and help us with things related to parks and recreation. So we'll be going to that board um, in spring and then uh, to council after that. And if you have any um, information, if you need any more information about this or just wanna see when the next meeting might be, it will be posted at this website or you can certainly we have my contact information there as well as the main parks line you can call um, to uh, ask us anything you might have related to measure m or athletic fields of course um, and your priorities and i am going to thank you all so very much for attending and turn it back over to rochelle to close us out and add any closing remarks she might like, but from the city, from everyone at the city, I want to thank you all so very much. I know this is the longest meeting ever, and I can't thank you enough for participating. And I will turn it back over to Rochelle, and let's go back over to that last slide. Hopefully, Rochelle was able to stay on with us. Yeah, there she is. <laughs> Hi. So I um, thank you again, everyone. And um, I want to say that there's a you know, letter writing goes a long way as well. If you can't make the council meetings, um, if you can't make the Board of Community Service meetings, which um, meet just once a month, but if you can't make them, send an email or a letter um, to, well, send an email and write in what you want all the time, every time. You would be amazed at um, the attention that they, they, they start to really understand. Uh, and I think that, um, some of you have youth in your groups, have them write letters. That's a great um, way to be introduced to how the city works, uh, a, good, a good civic lesson. So um, take an opportunity to try and do those things throughout the next couple of months. Uh, if you have a letter that you think is pretty good, send it and share it with the other um, leagues that are around and have just, they can just copy it and send it in as well. So it's the more the merrier. 
which I just want to close and say thank you and have a Merry Holiday. Great. Thanks so much, Rochelle. And thank you all very, very much. And um, definitely keep in touch. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you.